Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Carol Werner, and I'm the Executive Director of the Environmental and Energy Study Institute. I'm very glad to see you all here this afternoon for this last briefing in this particular series in which we have been looking at climate impacts on a regional basis uh, coming out of the National Climate Assessment, which looked at different regions across the country, drawing together people from many, many perspectives, scientists across uh, the country, looking at what are the impacts, what does this mean in terms of thinking about adaptation and resilience, and drawing upon the perspectives and advice of people from academia throughout, as, as well as all sorts of practitioners across the country. So. We have looked in previous briefings at impacts in the southwest, southeast, last week at the Midwest, today at the northeast. And I think that we are all very, very much aware of having seen in very recent years the terrific impact that extreme weather events has had in this very populous area of the northeast. And we are very honored today to bring together some of the important uh, voices and some of the leadership that has been looking at this whole area of the Northeast, what this means in terms of thinking about how do we do a better job, how do we do um, uh, a more uh, comprehensive and holistic approach to managing these risks in the Northeast when we're dealing with a huge built infrastructure, very, very large population, and lots and lots of issues when you think about the enormous economic interests and all of the people uh, and property that are involved. So we will hear first in terms of kind of laying out the findings from the National Climate Assessment uh, and from the uh, convening lead author of the Northeast chapter of the National Climate Assessment. And then we will hear from other people who are engaged in really looking at what does this mean in terms of planning in the Northeast with regard to managing these risks, what is underway, because these the states of the Northeast are very aggressively looking at these issues, assessing what needs to be done and how best to move forward. So our first speaker is Dr. Radley Horton, who is the, uh, an associate research scientist at Columbia University. And he is here also in the, the context of his being the convening lead author for the chapter on the Northeast for the National Climate Assessment. And he also teaches at Columbia's Sustainable Development Department as well. And he brings an interesting combination. He's involved as a co-leader with regard to a number of other efforts underway dealing with climate and adaptation and resiliency issues in terms of efforts underway that NASA is working on that are looking at stewardship and what does this mean in terms of adaptation and stewardship, also in terms of NOAA, and also working with the United Nations Environment Program. So he is working with many different entities um, and has also been involved working with uh, and was the climate science lead for the New York City panel on climate change. So I am pleased to turn to our first presenter, Dr. Horton. Thank you, and thanks for the chance to speak with all of you um, today. So yes, I'll be talking about uh, the Northeast region, as we heard, one of the eight regions uh, covered in the latest uh, National Climate Assessment. Uh, before getting started, I wanted to uh, pay thanks to, to some of the groups that are so critical in, in getting this, this assessment uh, together. First, I wanted to acknowledge NOAA's RESA program for supporting the Consortium for Climate Risk in the Urban Northeast. I also wanted to thank NASA's Earth Science Division um, for all of their work uh, supporting the National Climate Assessment, USGCRP, and then of course all of the agents, all of the uh, city government, federal government uh, for all the support in the assessment as well. 
So quickly, an overview again at the highest level on the National Climate Assessment. Uh, this was the most comprehensive assessment to date, the third National Climate Assessment was. It had approximately 300 authors representing private sector, NGOs, universities, a really broad set of voices, and looking at a much broader set of topics than prior assessments had as well. In terms of the findings, um, the key messages being that climate change is already happening. This isn't just an issue about the future. As we'll see when we talk about the Northeast, climate change is already happening and it's having impacts already uh, on all the populations uh, of the Northeast. Uh, and an another message though is that especially I think in the Northeast, there are actually a lot of solutions already in, in play, um, mitigation and adaptation solutions. Some of them are in sort of early days, early phases, but we've reached a point where there's a lot happening and I think that gives us the potential to sort of invert the discussion in some ways, start from talking about visioning the futures that we wanna have and some of the solutions that uh, can get us there. Let's see if I can make this pointer work. Oh, and also just to quickly acknowledge within the Northeast now, um, uh, some of the team that, that, that um, put this report together. These are, the, these are the authors for the chapter. We also have a technical input report that we're developing that had 50 or 60 uh, additional authors who contributed to the work. Okay, so as we delve into now the Northeast, the broader context, we know that carbon dioxide has increased in the atmosphere about 40% since the start of the Industrial Revolution. Methane has gone up about one and a half fold. Uh, this is a product of burning of fossil fuels, land use changes, and as I said earlier, it's already having impacts um, in the Northeast. So here are some of the things that we've already observed. Globally, in the global average, about eight inches of sea level since 1900. Here in the Northeast, it's more like a foot. We'll talk a little bit about some of the reasons. Partly it has to do with impacts of higher greenhouse gases, changing ocean circulation in a way that brings up sea level in the Northeast, but partly it's simply just due to the fact that much of the Northeast is sinking. Talking there about why we're getting more than eight inches um, in the Northeast. Another key finding, Heavy rain events, that sort of extreme tail, the downpours, are becoming much more frequent. There's been more than a 70% increase since the middle of the century in those heavy rain events. Temperatures have gone up about two degrees Fahrenheit since 1900 in the Northeast. That's more than the global average. It's more than the US average. We'll talk about how that's already changing the frequency of the extreme temperature events that impact people infrastructure uh, and ecosystems. So those are sort of some of the key three observations um, uh, about what we're already seeing. Okay, so let's delve in a little more now to each of those three variables, talk about what we expect for this future, for the future of this century, and what we think the impacts are gonna be. Okay, so I said in the Northeast, we've had on average about a foot of sea level rise since 1900. If you can see here how that breaks down, um, less than a foot for a lot of New England, not much less than a foot, a little less, but then as you get into some of these regions down here, more than a foot, and if we were to go down to Norfolk, which has been in the news a lot in Virginia, a little outside the Northeast, but not much, actually about a foot and a half of sea level rise since 1900. These are at the levels where we're already seeing a lot of impacts today. Coastal flooding is happening much more frequently, um, and even those sort of routine high tides are really starting to have a big impact on, on people and infrastructure. And then you, just to pull out one example here, this is the tide gauge um, at Philadelphia going back to uh, 1900. So that's the past. And just to quickly highlight again, that level of sea level, sea level rise already matters. It's estimated that about 70 square kilometers of additional area flooded due to sand, during Sandy simply because sea levels were a foot higher than they were before. Something on the order of perhaps as many as 80,000 additional people experienced flooding um, in their homes because of that higher sea level. Sea level rise had raised the baseline when Sandy came. Now let's talk about what we expect for sea level rise in the future. Um, the National Climate Assessment, uh, we had a technical input report that was released. It documented a range of possible outcomes. If we take a projection of something like two and a half feet of sea level rise, which we might think of as sort of a high end scenario for the 2050s, that same two and a half feet, by the way, though, if we go out to say the 2080s or 2100 is a very middle of the road projection for how much sea level rise we might get. Just that level of sea level rise alone for most of the Northeast will mean coastal flooding will happen about four times as often as it's happened in the past. 
So we're not talking about hurricanes getting any stronger. We're not talking about nor'easters getting any stronger. We're not talking about extreme sea level rise. We're talking about just gradual, routine sea level rise leading to a situation where coastal flooding is happening much more frequently. Something that used to happen maybe once every 100 years becomes something you expect to happen during the lifetime uh, of a mortgage, for example simply due to sea level rise. So what are the impacts in the Northeast, right? We have enormous populations um, living in the current FEMA flood zones. Um, before you think about sea level rise, something like a million and a half people uh, vulnerable. We have trillions of dollars in infrastructure, right? Our iconic rail networks, everything from Amtrak, a lot of the commuter railroads, electrical substations, wastewater treatment plants, uh, naval facilities, you name it in our coastal zones. Uh, fuel storage depots, refineries, um, just a, a huge amount of assets um, vulnerable uh, in those coastal zones. And it's not just the coast that's affected, right? We have to think about supply chain disruptions. Uh, we have to think about impacts on commerce um, as these coastal areas increasingly uh, get flooded in the future. And it's not just service disruptions, right? We, we, we saw some of these multiple system failures, for example, during Sandy, where one part of the system that's underwater goes down knocks out a much broader system. We expect much more of that. Um, that leads to service disruptions. Um, key utilities can't provide uh, the services that they're need, required to, to, to supply. But additionally, of course, there's huge economic cost, right? Saltwater corrosion to electrical systems, saltwater getting its way into groundwater systems. These are the kind of things that, that, that we worry about. Um, but it's more than just sea level rise, right? We have a whole bunch of other concerns uh, we have to think about in the Northeast as well. I mentioned coastal, I mentioned the heavy rain events. You can see here, since the middle of the 20th century, most of the country has seen an increase in these very heavy rain events. But in the Northeast, it's been a more than a 70% increase uh, in those heavy rain events. So what does that mean? Um, it has impacts in those same urban areas that we talked about, more frequent combined sewer overflow events, situations where rainwater is falling faster than our land surfaces can take it up. A lot of times that water ends up integrate, getting integrated with sewage. We have these overflow events that foul a lot of our coastal waterways. Um, but I want to really highlight um, some of the non-urban issues here as well, because we're talking about the entire Northeast here, a 12-state region. If we look at so many parts of the Northeast, you know, really characterized by a lot of topography and very narrow valleys. This is everything from West Virginia, Western Pennsylvania, Western New York, Western Maryland, um, all the way into mountainous regions of Vermont, New Hampshire, and Maine. So these are areas where, um, you know, if you sort of did a, did a flyby or satellite overview, you see a lot of the critical infrastructure, the roads, but also things like the farms um, are located in a lot of those valleys. And if we see more of these heavy rain events, uh, that washes out a lot of that critical infrastructure. To generalize, a lot of these places are areas that don't have a lot of economic resources, a lot of resiliency to recover. Um, heavy rain events, very devastating issue for those regions. Hurricane Irene would be one example um, of a storm uh, that's, that, that's knocked a lot of those, that the air, a lot of those areas are still trying to recover from. Okay, now let's talk a little bit about heat events. So I mentioned earlier, we've had about two degrees of warming on the average in the Northeast. If we look at projections for the future, um, we might see something on the order of about four degrees Fahrenheit warming by the 2050s. There's uncertainty, but that's sort of a central, a central range, not an extreme estimate at all. Just increasing average temperatures by that much will mean much more frequent extreme heat days. So you can see here in this figure, this is for the 2050s, uh, changes in how often we get days over 90 degrees. In the current climate, anywhere you see those orange colors, those are places that have, in the typical year, more than 20 days uh, over, where, where maximum temperatures go over 90 degrees. Then we go out to the 2050s under two different possible futures of greenhouse gas concentrations. B1, where we sort of reduce our emissions fairly quickly. A2, where we continue to emit um, at a high trajectory. In both of those scenarios, either one, you can see a dramatic increase by the 2050s in, how, in these days over 90. To generalize, doubling or tripling of the frequency of days over 90 degrees. It also means that the highest highs are that much higher. Um, it means longer durations to heat waves, warmer nights. So the impacts on human populations are something that I wanted to highlight here. We know that so many of our communities, heat is the leading um, weather-related killer in the US. 
Um, we have so many vulnerable populations, the young, the elderly, those with pre-existing health conditions, those who don't have access to air conditioning, just to name a few groups. Um, this is a major uh, issue going forward. Um, to some extent, we can link it to things like urban heat island in our cities. Uh, we know that where we have a lot of pavement, where we've removed a lot of uh, forest, temperatures can be in some cases as much as 5, 10 degrees warmer uh, during the hottest periods. You can just see here quickly, that's Central Park with its, for with its forest showing up about 10 degrees cooler in terms of the actual surface temperatures there. So that's the urban story, right? So the, a lot of the urban population suffering from more heat. Um, air quality can deteriorate when those temperatures get really high. And if you push the highest temperatures up just a little more in the hottest days, much greater risk of power fail failures as well, precisely when people need, need that uh, the most. Not just an urban issue though, right? As those temperatures go up, some of those rural areas, um, for example, in a lot of northern New England where you don't see much air conditioning today, um, there's gonna be a you know, greater and greater vulnerability uh, going forward. Okay, so now I wanna shift gears, just quickly uh, speak a little bit about some broader impacts. On the health side, it's not just temperatures. We need to also be thinking about things like what is gonna to happen to insect pests, uh, what's gonna to happen to air quality, as I mentioned earlier. Allergens, as we see more carbon dioxide in the atmosphere as temperatures go up, are we gonna see more and more people suffering from allergies? And then more generally in terms of our agriculture and ecosystems, this is a complicated story. Um, in some ways we might see some benefits, some agriculture may benefit in the next couple decades from higher carbon dioxide, from shorter winters. On the other hand, we're also going to see uh, more, weed pet, more weeds and other pests benefiting, a lot of potential trade-offs there. Um, on the fisheries side, we expect the cod and lobster um, to suffer um, in the southern part of the domain, but potentially do better in the north due to changes in ocean temperatures. Okay, in my remaining time, I wanna switch gears and again emphasize that a lot is happening in the, in the region in the way of adaptation and mitigation. I think the other speakers are gonna go into this uh, in much more detail, but all but one state in the region now has an adaptation, has a climate change plan. These processes are being developed. It's a long-term process, but there's all sorts of examples we can point to as well of things that are underway. On the sea level rise, sort of coastal resilience side of things, we've seen NOAA pioneer a coastal sea level rise viewer that includes sea level rise projections so people can see their vulnerabilities. Um, we've seen communities uh, uh, helping people who are in repeated flood zones move out of those areas, retreat away from the most vulnerable uh, parts of the population. Um, in terms of preparing for heavier rain events, we've seen investments in green infrastructure by cities to capture some of that rainwater. We've seen Maine um, develop really a statewide plan. Every time a culvert, one of those sort of run-of-the-mill drainage systems under a road needs to be replaced, building in an extra factor, making that pipe a little bit wider to account for these heavier rainfall events in the future. These are things that are already happening. On the heat wave side of things, cities like Philadelphia and New York, real leaders in terms of getting more cooling centers, even helping people get air conditioners who need them the most to some extent, um, heat advisory plans, um, planting more trees for shade, um, and encouraging community members to look out for the most vulnerable members of their communities during heat waves um, and other types of, of natural disasters. Okay, so clearly a lot is happening in the way of mitigation and adaptation in the region, but we are in the early stages, um, and to highlight that not only are we not there in terms of addressing our vulnerabilities now, but again, these vulnerabilities are gonna go up dramatically, um, uh, even if we get on the best mitigation trajectory, which we need to do so we even are able to adapt so that the challenges aren't so big that they're, they're more than we could possibly uh, adapt to. So to, to sort of close, um, to, to turn to um, uh, some of these adaptation strategies that are underway. So New York City has been a real leader um, for several years, going back way before Sandy, in thinking about uh, vulnerability, developing a mitigation plan as part of Plan YC around 2006 or so, and then an adaptation plan around 2008. That helped very much when Sandy struck. It helped, there was a plan in place to evacuate a lot of people. There was a plan in place to protect some of the rolling stock, the, the, the train cars that Metro North had. Some of those strategies reduced the vulnerability during Sandy a lot, but, but clearly given the extent of Sandy's damage, it wasn't enough. Um, the city reconvened the New York City Panel on Climate Change to look at some of those vulnerabilities. And here you can just see some highlighting uh, some of the impacts of Sandy. Uh, 
very much an impetus to, to push even further forward in the city and the region, as we'll, as we'll hear more about uh, today. That's the, the uh, South Ferry subway station, which I think suffered something on the order of half a billion dollars in, in damage during, during Sandy alone, flooded bottom to top. Um, so the New York City Panel on Climate Change uh, reconvened um, and looked at, for example, sea level rise projections. We found an innovative approach that looked at components, things that influence sea level rise that hadn't been assessed by a city before. And I just quickly wanted to highlight that New York City has taken this risk-based approach, comfortable with the idea that there is uncertainty. Um, and depending, and this is a risk issue, depending on what um, the city is trying to protect, if it's a critical asset that might last 100 years or so, uh, the city is considered, for example, a 90th percentile case of more rapid sea level rise. Um, and I think embracing the science uh, is something that, that really New York City really stands out for. It's encouraged these resilient sort of long-term approaches um, uh, that, that put New York City front and center, but we need to emphasize that we need continued federal leadership. Some of these problems are too, too big for any city to take on alone. We need to have, uh, take on alone. We need to have coordination across different entities. Um, uh, private sector engagement, uh, and we need to keep in mind that there are a lot of cities and communities aren't going to have the resources to uh, take some of the steps that a place like New York City can. Okay, thank you. Thanks very much, Radley. Well, we're now going to turn to Scott Davis, who is a senior advisor for the office, in the Office of the Secretary at HUD, the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development. Since Scott joined HUD uh, about five years ago in 2009, he has been involved with disasters. Um, with, and I don't think he's not been the cause of them, but he's been responding to them. Um, and he has been the director of the Disaster Recovery Division. He was also a senior advisor with regard to the President's Hurricane Sandy Rebuilding Task Force. And he currently, and we are anxious to hear more about this today, but anyway, he is currently uh, administering the HUD's Rebuild by Design, a planning and design competition to increase resiliency in the whole region affected by Sandy. Prior to coming to HUD, and, he, and therefore he brings a very rich background in terms of having to think about all of these kinds of disasters and what does it mean to become more resilient. Because before coming to HUD, he was at the Department of Homeland Security where he had been involved with Gulf Coast, with Gulf Coast rebuilding um, after, um, after looking at the 2005 hurricanes. And he had worked in Louisiana with, with FEMA. And so he has been part of dealing with long-term community recovery for a long time. And he also brings a perspective of having worked at the state and local government level too, and that he'd worked on community and economic development issues in Ohio and also Arizona prior to his joining federal service. Scott, thank you. Uh, thank you, Carol, and, and thanks to ESI for, for putting on this briefing. I think it's a real great opportunity to, to highlight and frame some of the, really, the critical issues that we're dealing with today. Um, and uh, thanks to Dr. Horton so, for so expertly framing, uh, framing the issue and, and really uh, setting forward what we have in front of us. Um, what I'm going to talk a little bit about today is, uh, is what we do with all this information. Um, so we have great science now, we have great data, and how do we make that meaningful and in informing how we move forward and what that looks like. Um, so I'm going to do that through the lens of a recent uh, competition that HUD just sponsored called Rebuild by Design. Um, uh, the City of New York um, and a couple teams working in, in New York City and I've uh, been working with Dan for the last year uh, on this as well. Um, but. Uh, Rebuild by Design was uh, essentially a, a, a two-phase competition, um, understanding that uh, in order to arrive at the best and most appropriate solution, you really need to uh, 
uh, understand the nature of the problem. So the first phase of the competition was spending three months just doing regional research and analysis, understanding risks, vulnerabilities, interdependencies at a regional scale and level, and then moving forward with now what do we do about that and where do we go about doing it. Um, so I'm going to kind of move through, uh, through this. Um, this is the past. Um, this is the future. And so we can clearly see that how we go about building uh, in the future um, needs to be different than how we've gone about building um, historically. This is all centered around the notion of risk. And so when we think about risk, what does that mean? Risk is not the same uh, in every square mile within the FEMA 100-year floodplain. Uh, risk is really the factor of probability that an event might occur relative to the consequence of that. Um, so the amount of people, the amount of assets, um, the amount of land damaged um, as, as a result of the, uh, the, the event. So essentially you're looking at risk as a factor of, you can have some events that maybe have a more frequent or high probability, such as a hurricane coming into the Gulf Coast. Um, where the consequence may be it hitting a, a city of you know a little less than a half a million, or a lower probability event um, coming into you know up the northern seaboard uh, to hit New York City, where there are millions and millions of people um, and and assets uh, at risk. Just in the New York New Jersey metropolitan area, two and a half million people live within the 100-year floodplain right now. Um, and this is based on, again, flood maps that do not incorporate or factor in sea level rise. Uh, so if you were to you know, redraw this map 10 years from now when we have better data and, and are looking forward with information, uh, there'll be even more people within the floodplain. In understanding risk also, it's how we go about doing it and communicating it at an individual level, um, how we make personal decisions. And so when we go about that, talking about 100 year floods and defining floodplains in terms of being 100 years, just because you had a flood last year doesn't mean that you shouldn't expect one for 99 more years. It's really what that means is there's a 1% annual chance in any given year that, that a, this flood may occur. And when you multiply that out or put those in more simple terms for folks, you know, it's, it's five times more likely than getting a flush in poker, very everyday terms. It's a one in four chance that you'll be flooded in the, in, you know, before you pay off your mortgage if you're a homeowner with a 30 year mortgage. So it's a very different thing thinking about living in the 25% chance floodplain versus the 100 year floodplain. It's the same floodplain, it's the same risk but it's how you understand it and it informs how you make decisions. So um, back to kind of sea level rise and uh, extreme events or hazards. Um, they're kind of uh, two ways that they uh, affect the landscape. Um, uh, one, you know, through hurricanes and storms, you, you see storm surge, which has uh, a more dramatic effect on uh, people, buildings, and uh, in the land and erosion. But um, gradual change with sea level rise ultimately has, uh, has the same uh, consequences. Um, FEMA, uh, again, goes about defining their flood maps uh, in terms of the, the most dangerous or high risk areas being, uh, they call it in, in, in the A zone, where there is uh, wave height or storm surge possibility. And so, while well, you probably can't see it that well from here, um, a good portion of the New York and, and New Jersey uh, coastline uh, is really subject to that. This is an example, this is one small slice in Long Island in Nassau County. Uh, if we were to look at a category two surge, um, that's what would be inundated. inundated. It's a little over 100,000 structures. Um, so when you see as sea level rises and, and you get, uh, and you get these storm surge events coming on top of sea level rise. Um, the, the water doesn't only come from the ocean, the water comes from the sky, and to Dr. Horton's point about extreme rain, it's the commu communities and their ability to handle the, the rain falling from the sky in addition to perhaps the coast. And 
uh, and the rainfall needs to you know, go into runoff, and so you have these riverine conditions, but um, when the outflow pipes, uh, when the waters rise above the outflow pipes and, and the surge comes in, the water doesn't have anywhere to drain out into, and so you get conditions like this where, um, where even though you're in a, na a neighborhood that's not right along the coast, you're experiencing some pretty devastating flooding um, because of an inability to adequately drain uh, the, you know, the, the basin that you're living in. So it's really important to go about planning in, in a way that understands that um, uh, floods and water flows from different directions and it flows in different directions, it drains in different directions. At the base of informing how we go about doing things is to understand resilience and risk at a regional level because it's really about larger systems and their interdependencies. Um, you ask why are we also always so focused on you know, the New York, New Jersey metropolitan area? Um, it's really because that's where all the people live. That's where the greatest number of lives, of, of you know, physical assets, of buildings, and, uh, and, and the environment are, are, are at risk. Um, and it's also a point where there's a unique kind of, um, uh, kind of concentration or nexus or convergence of multiple key systems, infrastructure systems coming together uh, and there are large interdependencies serving a very large population there with those systems. Um, so you have a, a, a unique thing happening there. So in terms of going about a regional analysis, um, and what the design teams did through the competition is looked at, you know, they go about looking at um, different systems relative to one another, layering that on top of one another. Then you look at how people interface with that, how the economy interfaces with that, what does the natural environment look like, and, and to do this kind of um, layering effect. They, what they ended up, once they started looking at the region, what they found is that once you look at it, 75% of the power generation lies within the 1% annual chance floodplain. Um, a good portion of the electrical grid is underground uh, and therefore um, it's underwater when it floods and you get scenarios like this. Um, also looking at potential for pollution, 80% of the regional fuel storage lies within the 100, uh, the 100 year floodplain. Um, when you go about and start mapping uh, other facilities uh, that uh, store hazard, hazardous materials, electric power facilities, uh, communication facilities, oil, gas, water, wastewater, you can see that um, where the vulnerability of these critical infrastructure facilities are. Then you go about looking at where people live relative uh, to this risk and primarily in where the most vulnerable folks live. Um, this, is, uh, this is Manhattan. Um, one of the projects that we'll be funding as a result of the competition is uh, in the lower east side of Manhattan. And it's not because Manhattan is sexy, but it's because uh, that's where the, the highest concentration of public housing units in the nation resides. More than 29,000 units uh, are there within the 1% annual chance floodplain. Um, so, it's about looking at, uh, looking at your physical vulnerability and then overlaying that with your social vulnerability. And to look at social vulnerability, you can look at factors like, um, like you know, the very poor, the very young, the very old, the disabled. Um, and then overlay that with your economic vulnerabilities. Where are your commercial districts? Where are your ports? You know, where are your jobs located, your economic engines? And then that will, gives you a sense of to where to focus in on, where are those opportunities um, and places to, um, to engage. Um, so it's, uh, what do we do with a scenario like this? Uh, historically in the United States, we have kind of two primary um, methods of, of dealing with uh, flood protection. One is to, um, to uh, essentially to reinforce, to, to, uh, to, to build a wall, and, uh, and we do this in a lot of places. Uh, some places it's not appropriate or not possible. So um, the other opportunity is to retreat or relocate, uh, and sometimes that's not a possible solution either. 
Um, so you need to explore alternative solutions other than simply building a wall or moving entirely. And how do we, how do we look at the future of our, uh, of our cities, recognizing that those two things aren't always the 100% answer, although they are often a part of the answer. Um, so we are looking at the design teams look through a, a series of design approaches that there are all different kinds of things that you can do uh, to go about uh, managing flood risk and reducing um, vulnerability um, through uh, structural solutions and drainage basins or constructed ecologies and natural solutions. Parks can serve as, as a flood wall if designed properly. So when you start to take these different design approaches and mix and match them with different unique types of geography, you can get a different approach for, you know, for, for different places that works, but also provides co-benefits and other cultural amenities that, that, that serves as more than just a flood wall or an open space. And even if the solution is just a wall, a wall doesn't just have to be a wall. It can be a variety of things. It can be you know, a bench, it can be a, a, you know, a, a skate park, it can be a, a, a number of things. And a, and, a, and a berm doesn't need to be just a berm. Uh, a berm can be a, you know, a tidal flat or a, a breakwater uh, or, or an oyster reef. Um, so the, the point is that resilience, um, you know, it's not about what it looks like. It can look like a lot of different things. Resilience is about how it performs. And so what you're looking for in resilience and what we're hoping to see as a result of the rebuild by design competition is, is resilience that, you know, is something where you see physical resilience, um, but you're also seeing ecological resilience, you're seeing social resilience, and you're seeing economic resilience. And, and when you're looking through all four of those lenses in your approach, that's when, you know, to the title of our, our, our meeting today is that's when resilience really begins to evolve, I think. Uh, that's really it, and I guess we take questions afterward, but, okay. yep. Thank you so much. Uh-huh. We'll next turn to Dan Cirilli, who was appointed by Mayor Bill de Blasio as the director of the Mayor's Office of Recovery and Resiliency for the City of New York. Uh, and there he is leading the implementation of New York City's uh, initiative called A Stronger, More Resilient New York. And we're going to hear a lot more about all of that directly from, from Dan. He is also serving as the acting director of the Office of Long-Term Planning and Sustainability. Prior to this, he had worked on the city's efforts to develop a comprehensive coastal protection plan for New York City's five uh, five boroughs and was named the city's first director of resiliency in 2013. He brings an engineering background, having worked for Bechtel Infrastructure and had also in uh, prior to this role for the mayor's uh, office, he had also been involved in working for uh, maritime assets uh, for the for the city's. Uh, Economic Development Corporation. So he's very, very familiar and, have, and has had to deal with a lot of looking at what is involved, whether it's cruise terminals, all sorts of coastal infrastructure issues. So Dan, we're happy to have you here today. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you, Carol, and uh, thank you, Paul, for helping organize this event. This is a great forum. Um, thrilled to be here on behalf of uh, Mayor de Blasio and uh, to talk through a little bit about what the city's efforts are given all these scary things that um, we keep hearing from uh, Radley uh, on all these events. So the city's efforts for climate change really started in 2007. The city released a plan called Plan YC um, that was it initially kicked off as an infrastructure plan, thinking about how the city was going to um, prepare itself for a million new residents that were going to be uh, coming into the city by 2030. Um, what comes with that is a, is a range of infrastructure needs, housing needs. Um, but importantly, it was the first time that the city had really taken a hard look at uh, climate change and developed a, a range of sustainability options. And Plan YC really was a world-leading sustainability plan for a municipality. But two really important things came out of that plan that didn't necessarily get the same amount of attention. And, and this is on the resiliency side. 
Um, the New York City Panel on Climate Change was set up. This is incredibly important because the, the work that was done since Sandy could not have been done if we had not taken the steps in Plan YC and with the New York City Panel on Climate Change um, since 2007. So the, the New York City Panel on Climate Change, uh, you know, esteemed academics that advised the mayor and set up specifically to advise the administration on climate change. That body had been working, had released a report in 2009. You've saw, seen some of the numbers from Radley's work. Um, as well, there was a climate change adaptation task force. Um, we brought together not only city agencies, but uh, state agencies, federal agencies, everybody that was in the region that needed this information that was coming out of the New York City Panel on Climate Change and needed to come together to think about how to use this information, think about their vulnerabilities and what sort of adaptation they needed to make. Um, and all of this thinking was incredibly important, but on the other hand, it was... Uh, didn't have the funding necessarily behind it to make a lot of the investments that needed to be made. Um, and, of course, Sandy comes along and highlights all of these vulnerabilities in a way that a, a task force really just couldn't have done um, as nearly as physically. Um, but the thinking, of course, was uh, incredibly important to be able to, to, uh, to, to begin thinking about these issues. Sandy comes along, highlights these vulnerabilities, and really causes us to redouble our efforts. We knew that we were on the right path, but we needed to do a lot more. Um, and so in the aftermath of the storm, in, you know, while all the recovery was going on, the immediate response, the, the, uh, you know, the, the short-term rebuilding, we knew that there was going to be a long-term rebuilding process. And, the, and we also had a hint, and we saw it coming, that there was going to be a massive um, federal response with dollars coming into the region. And we wanted to make sure that we were best set up to direct those dollars towards cost-effective investments that we could make sure that we don't just rebuild what was, but we rebuild better and we rebuild smarter um, so that we're better prepared for the next types of events that are coming. So we set up a task force to uh, identify these uh, investments that we can make to rebuild our hardest-hit neighborhoods, as well as strengthening these key critical infrastructure systems that were damaged during the storm. We did this by asking ourselves really three you know, foundational questions. You know, what actually happened during the Sandy and why? There was a lot of anecdote, of course, around what happened. Everyone had their own stories, but what we wanted to do was actually wrap that up in a, in a, in a rigorous analytical analysis, understand what was the storm, how did it impact our infrastructure systems, where the failures propagated through the system when the power went out, and what that meant for our hospitals, what that meant for our liquid fuel networks, a whole range of impacts. Um, and Sandy itself was you know, a very idiosyncratic event. It was, it was a unique set of wet meteorological conditions that came together that caused flooding 40% higher than the previous records in New York, um, going back through the recorded um, flood history in the city. And it was also, though, it was an incredibly high surge event, very little wind, very little rain. It was a unique event in a lot of ways and doesn't necessarily represent the worst of what could happen to the city. We also know that the timing of it, how it came into the harbor, of um, hitting the harbor at high tide at the Battery in lower Manhattan, um, it peaked at the same time as high tide peaked, and that caused some of the higher water levels. We also know that it peaked at exact low tide in the northern part of the city, up in um, near the Bronx and in, through Long Island Sound. So we started to recognize that it could have been different. We did some modeling, actually, that showed that had Sandy come in nine hours earlier, we could have knocked out the Hunts Point Food Distribution Center, where we get 60% of our produce, 50% of our meat and fish that come into the city. Everyone knows about the gas lines that happened. Maybe we would have had food lines. It could have been a totally different storm. And then to take that even one step further, um, what would have happened had Sandy come in during an August heat wave, which is, would still, um, is, you know, could still be peak hurricane season. So we've wrapped up a lot of what Sandy was, and, it was, and it's, you know, it's interesting and it's important to recognize what it was. And tragically, of course, 44 lives were lost, $19 billion in damages and lost economic activity. But other storms could have been worse. And then beyond that, we need to also be thinking about things beyond just coastal storms. Sea level rise, for sure, is, uh, is something that is going to be a long, of long-term consequence to the city. But heat waves, precipitation, other uh, wind, other, other weather events... Uh, we need to be prepared for. Um, and then if we can answer really those two questions, what happened, what could happen in the future, well, what do we do about it? Um, so one more point on climate change, and this is numbers that when, when we did call the New York City Panel on Climate Change back into service, they issued a new report based on the best available science in 2013, um, which our projections are, and our recommendations are, are based upon. We see a, a, a number of interesting things. On the chronic climate hazards, we see average temperatures increasing into the 2050s. We see in, uh, average annual precipitation increasing. Um, sea level rise, the, the mid-range of our projections into the 2050s is one to two feet. The high end of that projection is two and a half feet. 
Um, and we know that looking out, it's not going to stop. We know that looking out to 2100 and beyond, we could see any, the middle range projection into 2100 is two to four feet. It's a high end projection of six feet. There's a lot to consider here on what that's going to mean for our city. And that is based, that's on top of a foot of sea level rise that we've already seen in the city. Um, but we also know it's about extreme weather events. And we heard about a uh, number of days above 90 degrees. We have about 18 of those in New York City now. That at the high end of the projections into the 2050s could triple. And New York City starts to feel more like Birmingham, Alabama um, in the number of days over 90 degrees. And it's really important to think about what that means for our infrastructure, for sure, with uh, you know, whether it's our power grid, whether it's our telecommunications equipment, but the impact on people is, is even more fundamental. And, and um, vulnerable populations, adult care centers, all sorts of uh, vulnerable populations could be at risk with those sort of temperatures. And we know even today, that with the floodplains expanding, there's a lot more people at risk. With the maps that were in effect showing our significant flood hazard area at the time that Sandy came into the harbor, we had 218,000 people just in the city alone uh, in the 100-year floodplain. Those maps are being updated. That process kicked off in 2009. It'll be finished, we hope, in 2015. might be longer. Um, but already we know that that expanded floodplain is going to now include 400,000 people just in the city alone. That's more people that I think live in Atlanta. Um, it's the, the most, more people that in a, any other major city, um, it's the biggest floodplain of any other major American city. And looking beyond, because those maps don't include sea level rise, we've done those projections to show that if you add two and a half feet of sea level rise on top of those FEMA flood maps that we're expecting to come into effect, the number of people that live in the floodplain is gonna be 800,000 people. It's gonna double again. Um, this is gonna continue to grow into our, in our, coastal, our coastal flood hazard areas are gonna continue to grow. Um, that includes, so in numbers of people, even now we have 68,000 structures in the 100-year floodplain in New York City, and that is across a range of building types from the small bungalows in our beach communities all the way to uh, the towers in lower Manhattan, and, and this, the strategies there for, are different for all of them. So clearly, Sandy is just one type of risk that we face as a city, and we need to be cognizant of that, I think, in, in everything we do in thinking about resiliency planning. So in March, Mayor de Blasio made a major commitment to coastal and climate resiliency for the city and uh, released this report, One City Rebuilding Together, really to, to uh, lay out a policy framework for how we're going to continue um, uh, pursuing these plans, accelerating our housing recovery efforts, but as, and as well as expanding our resiliency efforts, enhancing our policy and planning, uh, continuing to secure additional federal and state funds to be spent in the, in the in these five boroughs on resiliency planning and making sure that we're seeing that as we're making these major investments, we're also seeing, we're also tackling some of the economic uh, inequality crisis that we have in the city and making sure that we're expanding workforce development and local job hiring. We're getting some of the, the, the co-benefits from these investments that we're making. And he set up a, a, a new, as a brand new commitment of a mayor's office of recovery and resiliency um, to lead these efforts. And it's continuing to, to base the, um, the primary efforts on this plan, A Stronger, More Resilient New York, that was released in June 2013, that is a, a multiple layers of defense strategy based on the best available science with a planning horizon into the 2050s, um, acknowledging that there's an adaptive nature to this, that we're gonna continue to monitor sea level rise and other climate hazards, and, can, and every four years, we'll be making upgrades to this plan. In fact, we're gonna be upgrading this plan next April. The multiple layers of defense is about strengthening our coastal defenses first, but we're not going to stop all the risks on the coast. We need to know that we're going to upgrade our buildings. We've passed a number of um, building codes to this effect. We also need to protect our core critical infrastructure, services, supply chains, and making generally our neighborhoods safer and more vibrant, which is fundamentally resiliency is about neighborhoods and making sure that the places we all live, work, and play are safer into the future. Um, this plan is 257 initiatives that we're going to continue to pursue. And it really, it buckets itself well into some physical things. We're going to be building new things in the city. It's coastal protection. We've got a $3.7 billion plan. Half of it's funded at this point. We're continuing to source additional funds. Uh, the Rebuild by Design program is a key element of, of our coastal protection plan, as well as a number of other infrastructure elements uh, that we know need investment. Uh, but it's also these social and economic resiliency efforts. And this is a citywide, not just a sandy, not just a coastal storm focus, um, looking at things like land use planning, looking at economic development, uh, strengthening nonprofits, and better emergency planning. It's a range of, it's a range of measures uh, in this plan that we're going to continue to pursue. And then, um, one last point on that. Um, 
really looking and thinking bold about bigger opportunities to transform our city and make sure that we're not just thinking about flood protection, we're not just building big walls around this, the edge of Manhattan or around the rest of the city, but we're finding ways to uh, transform our neighborhoods, increase our resilience, but also expand economic development, expand open space, clean up our wetlands. It's a, it's a range of bigger types of bold thinking that we think is going to be needed over, ultimately in the long term. So it's great to have a plan. It's more important to put that plan into action. We've already released our first uh, you know, report card on our, own, on our actions uh, as of April. We've launched that $3.7 billion coastal protection plan. It is half funded. We've got more than you know, nearly 3 million cubic yards of sand on our beaches that wasn't there beforehand. Um, we've passed 16 building code upgrades, and this is adopting those latest flood hazard standards into the code so people are building to the best and, and um, best available science. Also, we've added freeboard into our building code, so there's a, an allowance for sea level rise already big, baked into our building code for new construction. Uh, we've secured a billion dollars of investments with, with Con Ed, our local electrical utility, um, to make targeted storm hardening investments in critical infrastructure. And then a, a range of things on our, <clears throat> on our social and economic reforms, probably most important of which is, our, is the work we've done uh, with cities across the country, in fact, to secure flood insurance affordability reforms, um, uh, which are having a, a massive impact in our coastal communities. So of those 257 initiatives, about over 200 of them are un underway already. 29 have been completed. It's good early progress. We have a lot more to do. Um, so just to wrap all this up, th these risks clearly demand leadership, and the city sees itself in this position as, um, as a major American city that can, that can project leadership into this. We've always been at risk of these sort of coastal flood events. We know that these risks are growing, and it's not just about coastal floods into the future. And we have a very unique opportunity right now to make the right investments to buy down that future risk. And by doing that, we're going to make all of our neighborhoods and, uh, and, and residents safer into the future. So thank you very much. Uh, thanks, Dan. And that allows us to segue to our final speaker, Deborah Knoppen, who is working with Dan uh, as because of her expertise with regard to hydrology, environmental, and natural resources policy. Deborah is a vice president of the RAND Corporation, where she is the director of RAND Justice, Infrastructure, and Environment. And she brings a whole background in terms of looking at, as I said, hydrology, long-term water management. And she also had done a lot of work in terms of looking at governance and funding for U.S. Gulf Coast recovery. Um, uh, again, following the, the um, all of the, the issues that we've seen in the Gulf Coast with regard to uh, the enormous uh, storms and the recovery that has been needed there. She also has worked for um, the U.S. Department of Interior in terms of uh, being a Deputy Assistant Secretary for Water and Science, uh, has also uh, been a senior official with U.S. Um, uh, GS, uh, as, as well as having spent some time here on the Hill, having worked for Senator Moynihan and the Senate Environment and Public Works Committee. Deborah? Thank you, Carol. Well, one of the great advantages of uh, batting cleanup here is I get to take advantage of uh, the, the wisdom of my uh, uh, fellow panelists and draw on, on what they've already told you. Um, my focus is really on uh, how one, you, how, to, how regions uh, in both state and local governments as well as the federal government draw on the base of scientific information, draw on the kind of work that HUD has been pioneering uh, with Rebuild by Design, draw on the, on the, the many activities going on in uh, New York City, and bring it together into some kind of decision-making context that can actually help regions move forward. What I'd like to do is talk a little bit about an approach that, that RAND has pioneered in uh, taking on these difficult kinds of uh, uh, large-scale, highly uncertain problems, uh, moving toward consensus and decision making, uh, using our exam an example from Louisiana where we've been working for the last uh, six years or so, and now moving those methods into uh, the New York region, and we're working with Dan and other 
officials from uh, public agencies in the, uh, the New York City uh, region focusing specifically on Jamaica Bay. So I'll get to that at the, uh, the end of my talk. So part of the, the, uh, the challenge here with uh, adaptation uh, is that, that there are deep uncertainties. Um, so probabilities, if we can put assign probabilities to events uh, and to, uh, uh, to different scenarios in the future, that's great. But we don't have all of the information we need to do that. Um, we, know, we know we're learning more and more about uh, some of the climate change uh, trends, but there, there's still uncertainties there, as uh, Radley's presentation showed. Um, the actual impacts of these different scenarios on infrastructure has, has uncertainty associated with it. Um, other, other factors are changing. Climate change isn't the only thing happening. We have economic uh, development and economic uh, shifts, demographic shifts that also are going to impact the, uh, the consequence side of the, uh, the risk equation. Lots of data, people are talking about big data all the time, what do you do with all of that information in some useful format? And of all of these different approaches that you've been hearing about adaptation, which ones are actually gonna be, gonna work? Uh, work over the long haul. And that's uh, what our focus has been, really on decision analysis. Um, just by way of background real quickly, uh, the usual way engineers, uh, planners go about their business is they make predictions. You develop mathematical models of your system, and you, you uh, hypothesize what your future conditions will be. You then optimize that, uh, uh, that system and choose your near-term decision. And then you look and see how sensitive it might be to, uh, to different conditions. And that's sort of, that works well in many, many contexts. That's fine if you know, things aren't changing too much. You, you don't have a problem, you're, you're confident about your ability to predict and there's not too much disagreement. But these kinds of approaches can backfire when you have deeply uncertain conditions. You, there's a tendency to underestimate the uncertainties. You can sometimes have dueling models and that can contribute to some gridlock. And you can uh, give a false sense, the analysts can sometimes inadvertently give a false sense of certainty to decision makers uh, when that's in fact not the case and that sub subjects them to surprise. We have uh, developed uh, over the years at RAND, really coming out of much of our work on the national security side, uh, of a different approach that rather than doing this predict than act type of analysis for these complex uh, uh, problems with deep uncertainty. We talk about a robust decision-making process that really uh, builds on what you've heard the other speakers talk about of looking at vulnerabilities to the system as it is now, future without action, if you will. Identify those vulnerabilities, develop strategies to reduce those vulnerabilities and iterate on that. And that's, that's an adaptive approach and what we're trying to develop our ways in which we can look at a wide range of futures, of futures, many scenarios, not just a handful, but thousands or even more than that, and really understand the vulnerabilities of the system and where the effective responses may be. So just a quick summary of just the, the contrast between traditional approach uh, to uh, decision making and, uh, and those problems with deep uncertainty where we think robust decision-making is really more, more effective. Um, we've applied this to uh, water management and the, uh, the Colorado River Basin, and I have got references at the end of my presentation on that. Uh, flood risk management, uh, I'll talk a little bit uh, about the Louisiana example and then motivate that, into, uh, use that to motivate uh, our approach to Jamaica Bay. Um, and we've applied it also to energy resource management. So I think you all know the story about Louisiana and uh, the, uh, the hurricanes that uh, devastated the region. Um, in, it's not only um, the, the, the coastal flood risk, but uh, the land loss, and of course the land loss contributes to, to the, uh, the coastal flood risk, but also has major impacts on um, coastal eco ecosystems. Uh, the state is experiencing uh, uh, very high rates of land loss, about a football field every 45 minutes, I think, is the standard uh, uh, way of expressing that rate, uh, rate of change. Everything you see in red on that map is, 
uh, what is land that's expect, expected to turn into open water by uh, 2061. Very little green on there of where there's going to be land gain. Um, and what we saw in Louisiana really is transferable to the Northeast. Uh, it really uh, caps, it cap, in cap, encapsulates all of the challenges that you've uh, heard the other speakers talk about. There are many different projects that have been proposed uh, in the Northeast, and this was the case in Louisiana. Conflicting goals. You want economic development. Uh, there's tremendous pressure to build back up the way things were before. At the same time, you're trying to reduce risk. You've got water quality issues. Uh, you have uh, 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 ecological concerns that you're trying to protect. How do you balance those different uh, competing objectives? Uh, we don't agree on what the future will hold. There's a wide range of, there's still, you know, a range of uncertainty in our, uh, in our uh, projections of climate change that we know generally uh, what the direction is. Um, and and we, there's still a science base that's, uh, that's developing. So Louisiana managed, I won't go through all the details here, but Louisiana managed uh, after um, many decades of struggling to uh, put together really, I think, the state-of-the-art approach toward regional planning. Uh, they developed a 2012 master plan uh, adopted unanimously by the state legislature. Uh, it incorporated a fairly sophisticated systems models, so all these different uh, physical models of uh, of coastal processes, of, of habitat, uh, changes in habitat, of uh, flood risk, uh, were all brought together into an objective planning framework. That was where uh, RAND uh, assisted in developing a planning tool to take all that scientific information as well as engineering information about the many different options available to respond to these risks and, uh, and put it in a form where decision makers could make, make some choices. So, this planning tool was able to compare hundreds of projects of a restoration and risk reduction type. There were many proposed river diversion projects to build up the, uh, the sediment uh, and build up the, the uh, disappearing coastline. There were many marsh creation projects, uh, almost 100 other restoration projects. The Corps of Engineers and local sponsors had 34 projects proposed for lev new levees and walls and things like that. And there were what the Corps of Engineers calls non-structural risk reduction uh, projects where you uh, in, raise houses, change zoning, and do things like that. If you had built all the ones, all these projects that had been proposed, one, you wouldn't necessarily end up with a great uh, outcome. But uh, even if you were, it was going to cost probably $200 billion. And the state estimated that over the next few decades, it would have access to about $50 billion. So the idea was to figure out how, which among those hundreds of projects would be effective uh, over that time. And we used an iterative and very, uh, very much a transparent interactive public process to uh, work with stakeholders and decision makers, used a lot of visualizations to figure out what the trade-offs were among many different combinations and permutations of these projects. Uh, and, uh, we're able to go through that in multiple cycles, almost in real time, still looking at a wide range of possible futures and uh, uh, ultimately leading to a, to a plan. And just a quick summary um, uh, that emphasizes this approach of making sure the public understands what a future without action looks like. What you see in the blue bar there is current conditions. And using everything, and everything is expressed in 2010 dollars, we looked at this just captures a moderate and a uh, less optimistic scenario. This is if you didn't do anything more in Louisiana than what's been done now. With the master plan, the projection is that you're going to see a substantial reduction in the, in the costs of uh, expected annual damages on account of the implementation of the plan, if it is, in fact, implemented. Um, so there were uh, many advantages of this approach. I'll just uh, can look at the paper copy of the slides. Uh, but these, this has a, a proved to be a very useful method to really draw out the key assumptions, the project benefits, the costs, the trade-offs, and a, an approach toward developing adaptive plans that are going to evolve as, as information improves over time. As I said, we're applying this approach now 
uh, to Jamaica Bay. The Rockefeller Foundation uh, is supporting that. And by the way, I was the substitute for Sam Carter from the Rockefeller Foundation, who was going to be talking about the role of uh, phil the philanthropic sector in all of this. Uh, but one example of what Rockefeller is doing is supporting uh, RAND's involvement in working with a a uh, group of uh, state, local, and federal uh, agencies in trying to take an integrated approach to uh, uh, building resilience and uh, building uh, uh, a more robust uh, Jamaica Bay. Uh, we are, this is a multi-objective problem as well. It's not only the coastal risk reduction, as Dan mentioned, but there's a serious ecosystem restoration to be done that plays in, of course, to the risk reduction benefits. Uh, and there are substantial issues uh, regarding water quality. Um, this is going to be, this is just unfolding now. We hope, uh, you know, over the next year or so, we're going to start to see some, um, um, some useful out outcomes from it. Um, just in closing, the, the uh, principles of, of integrated coastal planning that uh, we've kind of crystallized from the Louisiana experience and other, other places where we've used these methods uh, is the, the essential involvement of the public from the get-go. Um, this is not something that should be done in behind closed doors or uh, with analysts making some of these very difficult uh, choices, values, that's what Good technical analysis brings those value choices to light and enables the decision makers to make those, those choices with, uh, with uh, good information. Um, so all of our work uh, is on uh, the RAND website. I've got uh, some links there explaining the robust decision making method in more detail. Uh, we did work on the Colorado River Basin for the Bureau of Reclamation uh, using these methods. and. We have a summary document. Uh, I didn't have bring enough copies, but uh, that too is available for uh, uh, for downloading. Thank you. Well, as has been made clear, I think in terms of how important it is to really learn from from the work that other people are doing, how it can help us. Uh, be better informed, make better decisions, recognize the, all of the different elements that need to be taken into account. And I must say, it really is incredible in terms of thinking about the holistic approaches that you all are, are seeking to bring in all of the complex elements that need to be woven together to really take account of how best to really create, to adapt, and to make communities, regions, ecosystems, the infrastructure and, and people more resilient. It is a, an enormous task and, and it's incredible what, what you all are doing. So let's open it up for your questions and comments and if you could just identify yourself, please. And if any of our speakers have points you want to add, please feel free. Okay, any questions, comments? Okay, we'll go back here first. Uh, New Orleans. Here's oh, I really have no affiliation. Uh, I'm just curious, with regard to Louisiana and now in uh, Jamaica Bay, you stress public participation as being important. Uh, how have you gone about securing public participation uh, in any real sense, either Louisiana or now in New York? Uh, Louisiana had a, a very sophisticated uh, public outreach campaign that was uh, run by the Coastal Protection and Restoration Authority and was initiated uh, more than a year and a half or two before uh, the final uh, development of the, of the master plan. Uh, it involved um, uh, not only uh, officials from the parishes, from many of nonprofit groups, uh, community leaders, uh, but they went into all those communities. There were hundreds, literally hundreds of public meetings all documented on the website for the master plan uh, that, uh, that uh, tried to keep the public informed all along the way, each step of the process. Um, it, was, it was quite interactive. In Jamaica Bay, we're just uh, really starting this project up. Uh, we're using the good offices of the Science and Resilience Institute, uh, which is a consortium of universities um, uh, supported by Rockefeller. Dan may want to say a little bit more about that. Um, that has a stakeholder um, uh, group associated with it, and there will be 
you know, plans that are, will be developed uh, as we move forward in making sure the affected communities are, are part of the, the process. Yeah, maybe, um, let me weigh in a little bit with New York's planning. So we, ha we have a, a very strong commitment to public engagement in all of the planning work we're doing. When we were developing our, our climate resiliency plan last year, we held an extensive amount of, uh, um, we brought an extensive amount of elected officials, community-based organizations directly to the public through public workshops. We did a, a broad array of uh, public engagement. And ultimately, the, you know, the proof is in the pudding on this. Uh, there was a poll released after, we, after, the, after our plan was released showing that 74% of New Yorkers actually supported the plan we had released, which I'm not sure you can get 74% of New Yorkers to agree on much of anything. So I think we did a good job, at least in getting out and um, building that coalition around what we were accomplishing, but there's a lot more to do, and we're ac absolutely committed to bringing the public into projects like Jamaica Bay through the, uh, there's a stakeholder task force on Jamaica Bay and on all of our projects, in fact. Um, it's, in, it's just incredibly important. Great, there's a question here. Thanks. Hi, Fuchsia, oops, sorry. Uh, Fuchsia Hoover from uh, the American Geophysical Union. And um, I was just wondering if any of you could speak a bit more about what steps you're taking to address some of the combined sewer system problems that are also impacting the city and how that's um, either influencing or contributing to your climate change action plan. I guess I'll take that one. So a, a key part of our, our, our climate resiliency plan recognizes that precipitation risk is going to continue growing in the city. Uh, we have uh, a several billion dollar commitment baked into our plan with city dollars to, um, to address a lot of those risks and reduce the amount of CSO um, events in the city. And it's things like, uh, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a full green infrastructure plan that our Department of Environmental Protection is advancing. Green roofs, bioswales, you know, non-traditional drainage that helps uh, uh, retain and store groundwater so it's not getting right into the system and right to the treatment plants and therefore causing those overflow events. Um, so we're making major capital commitments to reducing those events. Hi, my name is Brian Wee from the U.S. National Ecological Observatory Network, or NEON. And so this question is actually targeted at Dan, something that you said about um, in, uh, New York City having invested, um, you guys are planning to invest billions of dollars into um, new infrastructure and also building on what Scott had said about um, uh, these infrastru new infrastructure uh, possibly being, you know, things like cash basins and flood walls. The, the question here really is centered around um, unintended consequences, observations, and data. So with that much of an infrastructure investment going in, what thoughts have been given to um, the unintended consequences of that much new infrastructure um, over the course of decades? And is, have there been any thoughts about how you would observe the impacts of these adaptation measures, which might cause you to readapt to your adaptation measures? And, 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 and actually, Deborah had mentioned that big data was also a part of this whole conversation. So that slew of unintended consequences, observations, and data, do you guys have any thoughts about um, the way forwards with regards to that? Yeah, ab absolutely. In fact, um, I use that phrase a lot about it, unintended consequences. After 9-11, you know, the, the lesson was, let's get um, uh, fuel tanks off of the second floor because they could cause buildings to burn and collapse and so they went all in the basement. Well, then they all flooded. Um, so I think we want to be aware of what we're doing so we're not causing, you know, we're thinking ahead towards the next, next risk, whatever that may be, and trying to be um, targeted in those investments. And as we're thinking about a range of coastal protection initiatives, well, you could put a bunch of dunes and flood walls and wetlands and a whole coastal protection plan in place but it can actually, in some parts of the city, exacerbate precipitation risk, which is more likely anyway as a, in, as a source of flooding in many low-lying neighborhoods. And so we're trying to balance that to make sure that we are, um, without having to make major investments in pump systems behind uh, flood walls, that we've taken a, really a, a, a comprehensive approach to mixing and a hybrid approach to the, mixing the green and gray infrastructure that is thinking about a wide range of risks and not just the last risk that came. I think that's important to us. But really to your point on how we're going to monitor this going forward, I think this is in one we've, through the legislation that we've set up already in the city that 
requires us to update our plan. That's a, that's a key piece of this. We're going to be making investments. We're going to be learning things as we go. And we have to update our resiliency plan every four years and deliver that to our city council. So there's a, there's a baked in process for thinking anew about what we're learning as we're going. And this is not a, this is not something where we're going to throw a lot of money at, at a, at, you know, and spend $60 billion in three years and be done. It's just something that as the risks develop over time, we're going to continue um, assessing those risks over time and making investments and adapting as we go. And you know, along those lines, we've already, um, we're already putting in place a process to monitor sea level rise. And if sea level rise is happening faster than we anticipate in our current plans, well, we already know that we're going to be updating the freeboard in our building codes. So there's things like that. And in fact, working with the New York City Panel on Climate Change on indicators and monitoring, we're trying to figure out what are the right indicators and how do we best monitor that over time. And maybe Radley might want to weigh in on, on that piece, but it's, it's top of mind for us that we need to be thinking. It, it's not just make a decision once and be done. It's, it's going to be an adaptive nature. You know, Louisiana is adapting. It's doing uh, a revision of its, five, its 2012 plan. It will come out in 2017. Good planning of this kind needs to, it's not a one-shot deal. And uh, the essence of adaptation is to take in new information. Uh, if you see those early trends or warning signs or signposts of uh, unintended consequences, you need to adjust and change. But it's important that you've got the analytical framework to take in that information, uh, be continually improving your ability to, to represent processes uh, and the impact of in new infrastructures or interventions on, on um, you know, the overall risk of the region. So it's, this is a massive commitment required by regions. Um, we're, we're seeing the, the early signs with New York City being you know, absolutely the leaders in, in the Northeast, Louisiana leading in the Gulf Coast, um, and, but it's, it's, they, they can't, they're not going to be able to quit. I think uh, also on the, on the HUD side, what, um, what's really critical is that, um, is that in monitoring or, or measuring performance over, over time, um, those those, those activities are costly, and they need to be factored into the project budgets up front is considered part of the ongoing operations and maintenance. And, and so, um, you know, t too often, um, I think, uh, due to both the lack of funds and the lack of, uh, you know, an established consistent set of standards as to how to measure resilience. What does it mean? How do you measure it? I, and that's something else that, again, to invoke Rockefeller, that they're working on is looking at, um, and, and we across the federal government are thinking as well about, um, you know, what are uh, some consistent standards for, for measuring resilience um, so that everybody can be measuring and monitoring performance in a consistent way. Because at the end of the day, these investments are, are you know, very largely uh, publicly funded with local, state, and federal funds. And so that means they're viewed primarily through a, a benefit-cost analysis kind of uh, approach. And we really need to be able, at some point, to not just talk about the benefits, but to, to demonstrate them quantitatively. Just a, a couple quick uh, follow-on points. I think in a lot of ways, we really need um, uh, science initiative around this issue of, of evaluating uh, adaptations that are underway. Um, and just basic questions like, at what scale should a city be monitoring sea level rise? What's most relevant, local sea level rise or what's happening globally to the ice sheets? Those are the kind of questions. And as you start to implement a new adaptation strategy, at what point do you even have the scientific information to assess whether it's working or not? You get a string of a few years of weather that might be unusual. To what extent does that um, potentially misinform your whole assessment of whether it's working or not? So th there's a whole series of, of, of questions on the, on the climate science or weather side. And that's just one piece of it, right? We also have to be tracking, is the art of the possible? Are the technological innovations in the adaptation space changing? What are, what are other cities around the world doing? What are the exciting experiments that are, that are underway um, on the demographic, economic impact side of things? How are our projections changing? A lot of times, some of those uncertainties are probably going to be bigger than the, than the climate science uncertainties. OK. There, and, and I've got a question about that, too. But anyway, we'll go, we'll go over. I think there was a question in the back first. Uh, no, in front of you, was there? Okay, well then let's go up here. Oh, okay, go ahead. That's fine. 
Terry Hill with the Passive House Institute. Uh, I've heard a lot about water reclamation and issues uh, of that issue of that uh, type. Is any uh, work in all this research you've done uh, looking at the possibility of redesigning the electrical grid in this whole um, issue? Yeah, ab absolutely. Um, we've worked with Con Ed, uh, our local electrical utility. They had a most, they had a, it's a regulated utility. They had a rate case in front of the Public Service Commission in the state. And we ultimately worked with them, uh, and this, uh, this didn't make necessarily the headlines in the, at the end of the rate case. The, the headline was that rates were staying flat for the next three years. Um, but what was important is that they adopted the New York City Panel on Climate Change projections into their planning process. And so they initially, and that was, it took a little bit of work to get there, but ultimately they saw the value in, in looking at using those forward projections to think about the vulnerabilities at each of their substations and transmission and, and a full range of their assets. Um, and at the same time agreed to make about a billion dollars in storm hardening investments into the grid. But then, so that's, you know, that's investments into the current grid and how it operates. There is currently a proceeding ongoing uh, at the Public Service Commission that is really looking at, you know, what the utility of the future looks like and um, things like distributed generation and microgrids and other sort of next gen technologies that are being pursued. And there's a real commitment um, in the city and the state to pursue, to pursue those and ultimately see a, a much better, uh, more robust uh, and resilient electric grid at the end of the day. I'd say there's also a commitment on behalf of the, the U.S. Department of Energy as well, you know, investing in, in pilot um, projects, yes. um, a smart grid project in uh, Hoboken and in a number of places. So, absolutely. This is also the focus of the first report that will come out from the Quadrennial Energy Review that Secretary Moniz is uh, spearheading. So roughly uh, next uh, January or so, I think there's a report promised, and it's specifically focused on, on the uh, inf energy infrastructure, transport, transmission, storage, distribution, um, with an eye toward uh, its suitability, its, its resilience and uh, uh, ability to adapt to changing conditions. That's maybe a good bridge just to, to talk a little bit more about the greenhouse gas mitigation piece, which we haven't had a chance to emphasize that much in our limited time today. Um, but of course, as we get further out in the century, it's absolutely critical that we take the steps uh, today to reduce emissions um, if we're going to avoid some of these worst case uh, scenarios of, of extreme sea level rise, higher temperatures that could reach points that are sort of beyond our ability to uh, adapt, adapt to. Uh, and of course, there are all sorts of other co-benefits in terms of reducing our emissions um, as well to consider, as well as some costs. Obviously, it's a, you know, a cost-benefit analysis that we, that we have to do. Um, reducing emissions dramatically also is a kind of insurance because you know, what we're presenting here is sort of most likely scenarios based on a range of climate models. But we do need to keep in mind that there is the potential for surprises on the extreme end. The further we push the climate system, uh, the greater the risk that something could come along that's sort of outside of the central range we're projecting. If we get our emissions reduced more quickly, the odds of those kind of tipping points are lower. And we almost by definition, we can't know exactly where those tipping points sit. Question over here, and then we'll go over there. Okay. Thank you. Hi, um, I'm Karen Murphy. I'm with the Global Cool Cities Alliance. And I like the way, Dan, you, you kept talking about baked into a plan, and that helps me turn back to city heat. Um, extreme heat is now taken over as the most deadly form of, of climate related weather events. Okay. And I was just wondering, maybe Dr. Horton could talk about this. Um, whether you've looked at the low-hanging fruit of energy efficiency and installing reflective pavements and white roofs in cities as maybe as during the rebuild or just in general in the mitigation plans. I know that New York and Philadelphia have strong programs for white roofs. So Probably all of them address that. Yeah, so... Um, Certainly at the local scale, there's a lot that can be done um, in terms of, of providing more shade, increasing uh, ventilation. Um, as I mentioned, a lot of cities are leading. I think New York's actually done a lot, and others on the panel could probably speak, speak more to those details than me. Um, 
HUD has made um, uh, through the large disaster recovery appropriations that it receives um, from Congress uh, for the, the Sandy appropriation is in particular, it requires uh, green rebuilding standards to be used for any substantial rehab or, or repair. Um, so um, it literally you know, requires that all, all of the new building or uh, activity is, is thinking about those things. Right, and it sounds like you, you're, you're aware of our Cool Roofs program, but, um, for those that aren't, that we have a, a program where we uh, are essentially working with building owners to paint their roofs white. And uh, we've, what we've seen is that we, we know that has an energy reduction benefit and um, you, know, you don't have to run your air conditioners as long. What I think we're still working to prove is the case on the benefit of those for an urban heat island effect, which is a really interesting um, you know, next step on, on those sort of efforts. And so we continue to pursue those efforts. We also have, we have a really interesting program called Clean Heat um, that Mayor de Blasio has renewed and, uh, and committed funds towards where we're, we're converting uh, you know, the, the boilers in, in buildings that burn number four and number six uh, heating oil and put emissions out in particulate matter. Um, and there's a clear link between those emissions in particular matter and fatalities and hospital um, uh, uh, um, uh, visits. And right now we've made major investments in, in converting those over to natural gas and, and cleaning the air up. We actually have the cleanest air in New York City in 50 years, largely as a result of um, as programs like that. So. One more instance of having multiple benefits as a result of starting something, right? Um, okay, over here. This has been a great panel. My name is Shauna Udvardi. I'm with the uh, Weather and Climate Risk Program with the Center for Clean Air Policy. And I was interested in hearing your thoughts on um, the fact that we're spending billions and billions of dollars after a disaster. And I think you, you all have brought some examples of how we can do better to incentivize mitigation before a disaster. But I wanted to hear some of your thoughts on barriers and opportunities at the um, federal level, administratively, and then also legislatively, and through some opportunities that you see um, in, in um, incentivizing mitigation before a disaster. Well, you should all answer. I don't know who wants to go first. I'll go first. Um, absolutely. I think I think we uh, we're continually trying more and more to incent those type of uh, types of things. Uh, I know it um, at uh, at FEMA they're uh, leaning farther and farther forward on. Um, on uh, incorporating mitigation measures into their their standard infrastructure projects through the public assistance program to make sure that you know all infrastructure uh, and that's in cooperation with the, all of their grantees like the cities and the, and the states but really maximizing their statutory authority that they have under the disaster relief fund to to maximize the mitigation that can can happen and then it's one of the the challenges um, uh, you know honestly. Uh, from and Dan can speak to this is is uh, as a local city or, or a state as you're rebuilding you're really oftentimes using multiple pots of money uh, and it's like drinking from a fire hose after a major disaster so it's being able to combine um, it's a matter of timing and coordination to put um, one pot of FEMA dollars on top of another pot of FEMA dollars and then take HUD dollars and put that on top to make a very resilient, you know, uh, robust uh, mitigation project. Um, and it's, uh, in large part, the, the dollars are, are there, but um, it's, it's just, and, and acknowledging it's also a matter of, of priorities because there's just no way to mitigate the entire built landscape after after a disaster, um, we know there's a lot of it that needs to happen, but it's it's that decision making at, at the local level that's you know that's that's critical where they prioritize where their investments go and then they leverage maximize the leveraging of all the investments that that are being made and uh, you know there's there's uh, there's more and more that we can all do and especially at the federal level to help help everyone maximize that leveraging. Probably a, a couple of quick ideas um, uh, to throw out there. One is that you know insurance is a key component of, of mitigation and risk reduction, but some of the changes that have been happening in the in the federal program are causing insurance to become unaffordable. And, and one key thing that we in, within that that we've been advocating for is partial um, partial credit for partial mitigation. And, and the the idea is that with certain building stocks or even with um, 
really with all building stocks in New York City, uh, there's only one way to get premium credits, and that's by elevating your house, and that doesn't work for a lot of building types. And that, but there are other things that can be done to reduce risk, and but you don't get any credit for for some of those things unless you do everything. Um, so there's no partial credit for partial mitigation, and I think that's it's a, it's a disincentive to making the right investments that can reduce um, vulnerabilities. Um, there's a couple other things as well that you know in talking about FEMA. Um, you know, public assistance dollars that come through, it's all tied to damage. And so, you know, storms are unique and, you know, one, one storm may cause damage here but not over here, but that doesn't indicate your vulnerability necessarily. And we have, uh, you know, there's, there's hospitals that I can think of that are right along the coast in New York City that are not eligible for Sandy funds because they weren't damaged during Sandy, but they could easily be damaged during the next event. And, um, you know, so there's, you know, there are certain pots of money, but there's, there's not the full pot of the federal response that's really discretionary towards those sort of vulnerabilities that we have. Um, and then the last point is uh, around the Army Corps and their coastal protection projects, finding ways for all of us, and this is not a, a knock at the Corps, this is sort of a knock at everybody in this process, getting those projects built faster. Um, we had, uh, this is just one example, there was a project that was authorized in 1993 following a storm that never got out of the feasibility study process. And had, if, had, it, had it been built, could have saved lives, could have saved property. Um, only after Sandy the second time around did now that study get fully funded and we're actually moving pro forward to making the investment. But it was literally a 20-year study process that never got finished. Um, those sort of things we can't let happen. Yeah, just when I was on the staff of Senate Environment and Public Works, I was, had responsibility for the Water Resources Development Act, and we, there were proposed New York's, New York projects, Marich's Inlet and others, uh, that were wait, awaiting authorization and still haven't been built. Um, so this is, and it was a while ago. But just to add to Dan's point, this is, there's a very important federal, um, uh, issue here as to how we provide, how disaster assistance is provided and what the conditions are. Uh, private insurance or nas the National Flood Insurance Program was intended to try to uh, send a signal, a market signal to, to homeowners and communities about the, uh, their level of risk. There's, the program is obviously undergoing, uh, has undergone some reform, but um, you know, what this transition looks like and then what the expectations are for communities when a big storm hits for disaster assistance. Um, uh, how does that discourage maybe take up rates for, uh, for, for the flood insurance itself? So it's a complicated um, scene and really we're dealing, there's a tremendous amount of inertia in the federal statutory structure, not in the agencies, but in the statutory structure. To, to deal with kind of the reality uh, that we have now. Even the core had to, or the Congress put in special language for the, the Sandy um, supplemental bill to, to take into account, not just uh, to, take, to start to think about resilience. I'm not sure that word had appeared in very many other um, uh, core authorizations. Um, so there's, a, there's updating, uh, I think, that needs to be done and some coordination. Did you want to add anything, Radley? Or um, I guess maybe taking a little further afield, I think it'll, it'll be interesting to see in the future if a move towards um, sort of shareholders demanding more corporate risk disclosure also could be, could be uh, a growing piece of this equation as well. Um, uh, and also just thinking about things like media, uh, characterization of, of coastal flood risk, for example. Um, yeah, it strikes me as the kind of thing that, you know, with the passage of time is probably going to, um, going to pick up a lot and, and, um, may have bigger impacts, um, on perception of vulnerability than, than we'd think if we just looked at, at sort of recent trends in, in, in media coverage of, of for example, coast, coastal vulnerability. I, I can also add one, another challenge that I wanted to, to note is, is, um, Engaging the private sector in a more uh, meaningful level in, in these investments. Um, it's difficult uh, with a lot of this infrastructure, a lot of um, flood protection infrastructure, it, it's non-revenue producing. So it's not like you can, uh, you have an electric rate pair or a, a, water, a household that you, that you bill on a monthly basis for a levy. And so uh, it's, it's very difficult to, to figure out how to, how to finance and monetize that. But even though it's you know, largely publicly funded, uh, 
uh, the benefits are still experienced financially by a lot of private you know, sector interests. And we need to figure out a way to effectively you know, borrow against future savings and flood insurance pr premiums as, they, you know, if, as we all invest in lowering the risk and you can chart out the degree to the degree that you can that flood insurance will decrease because of the resulting decrease in risk, then how to capture those savings to, to invest up front. But that's a, it's one of the challenges. Okay, uh, back here, quickly. Uh, I'm all for community resilience, and I believe that uh, we should plan for and adapt to uh, potential disasters. But the reason I picked up on the RAND's public participation stress with regard to Louisiana and New York and presumably anywhere that you'd be involved is that I'm more interested in the resilience of our democracy. And when the suggestion is made that in Jamaica Bay, community leaders in addition to the mayor's office and the council and presumably all the state folks are involved, that, that's not regular folks. And we can't uh, really... Uh, retain our democracy unless there's such study institutes as EESI uh, having monthly meetings in Jamaica or in, in the bayou or throughout and around the country and the world. And I really am in favor of public participation. And for 40 or 50 years now, I've been wondering how and when the public is going to participate. And I thought maybe you had some suggestion as successful efforts uh, with regard to this subject uh, in Louisiana and New York, and I guess maybe you don't. But I wish you luck. I mean, I, I want you, go out and grab them by the lapel and pull them in to, and make them answer a survey. Make them tell you what to do. Uh, my experience in New York is that I uh, was never on a community board. I never would have been appointed. Uh, there were good regular folks active in my local community board, but for the most part, they were appointed by the borough president to essentially be a vehicle for uh, that borough president's uh, desire within the local neighborhood. And I don't see community boards, even if they're involved, as being uh, regular folks. Anyway, good luck. Okay, thank you. All I can say is, having been involved with many local community committees and organizations, you can inform people and encourage people, but you can't make people participate. So. That's also always a challenge, but obviously we all need to do as much as possible and in terms of encouraging and trying to make people see, I think all of us see, as you all, um, uh, I think, made very clear how important it is for all of us and for the public to understand also the cost of not acting because we all end up with enormous consequences as, as a result in terms of our communities in our neighborhoods. So I want to thank you. You were a terrific panel. And, and I want to say thank you for the very thoughtful um, uh, presentations and approaches that you are all taking in the work that you are doing. Uh, and we look forward to having many more questions. I've got a zillion that I would love to follow up with you on. And, and moving forward, because as you also all made clear, this isn't something that we do check the box and move on. We have to continually be vigilant and continually adapt our adaptation so that we can indeed be, become more resilient. So thank you very, very much. Really, really appreciate it. And really appreciate you all being here. Thank you.